Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Melanie Ionace. I am the Physician Relations Specialist here at Rothman. Tonight's webinar is with Dr. Brian Winters, foot and ankle surgeon. The topic he will be covering is foot and ankle woes in the weekend warrior, covering diagnosis and treatments for foot and ankle issues. Dr. Winters' office location is Egg Harbor Township. So just a few quick notes. At the bottom of your screen, screen you will notice a Q&A icon. So please um, feel free to ask any questions throughout the lecture, and we would love to hear from you. And then we will um, we'll address all the questions at the end. So also, without further ado, I thank you, Dr. Brian Winters, for joining us this evening and giving us of your time, and can't wait to hear about all the valuable information that you have for us. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, I think this is a nice venue that we started uh, back in COVID. I'm glad to see that it's continued. It's just good to be able to reach out to a lot of you and get some questions answered or give you some information that you may be asking yourself. Uh, this is obviously a very broad topic. Um, I include myself in this topic uh, these days. Uh, so I'm going to just touch on a couple, uh, three of the big ones that I see commonly here in the office. And again, you guys may very well uh, be able to relate to it. Uh, so just a, a little about me. So I have no disclosures as related to this talk, no financial uh, relationships. Just a little bit about my background. So I grew up in uh, New Jersey myself. I uh, grew up in Brick, New Jersey, up the uh, Garden State Parkway as we talk. We always talk in exits. I, I'm off of exit 91. I uh, went a bit farther north and did my undergraduate work up at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Uh, I had the pleasure of playing baseball for the Scarlet Knights uh, when it was the Big East. Uh, now it's the Big Ten. So I had a lot of good experience there. Uh, took a couple of years off and did some research actually in uh, surgical oncology uh, before I started my med school and didn't go too far and stayed up at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New, uh, New Jersey in New Brunswick now uh, by, goes by the name of Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. I uh, went all the way to Philadelphia to do my orthopedic surgery residency and uh, foot and ankle specific uh, surgery fellowship. Uh, so I would like to always say that I'm always more Jersey than the situation in Snooky. <laughs> so uh, as Melanie had said, uh, I've been kind of all over the place over the last decade between a few offices. I kind of consolidated here in Egg Harbor Township. I just found it was easiest to to be able to reach out to a lot of you guys and be accessible um, when I was in some of these offices, it just made it very difficult for some people to access me. So it seems to be working out overall well. Uh, as far as where I do my surgery, I do my bigger uh, inpatient surgeries, more complicated cases over at Atlantic Care Mainland Division. I do uh, still do orthopedic trauma over at the city division. And now uh, we have this state-of-the-art center for orthopedic surgery right next to our Egg Harbor Township office, where I'm actually able to do a lot of bigger cases, such as total ankle replacements. It's a very nice uh, facility if you haven't had the opportunity to see it. So again, like I said, this is a very uh, broad topic. So uh, we're going to kind of keep it around the ankle and the midfoot. Uh, so we'll start primarily around the lateral ankle. Uh, or outside ankle, uh, and this relates to more of your ankle sprains, uh, which occur more of in your acute setting, uh, or the, the, the inciting injury, and then when it becomes more chronic or problematic, you, it can lead to instability, so we'll talk about how we treat that. There's also a couple tendons on the outside portion of the ankle, which can contribute to outside ankle pain. So we'll talk about that. The perineal tendons will work our way back to the posterior ankle or the back of the ankle where uh, your heel is. And we'll primarily talk about Achilles tendon ruptures, which I tend to see the most frequent on Monday mornings from the weekend warrior. And then we'll move a little bit more uh, towards the foot. Uh, in the middle portion of the foot where may, you may have heard of a, the Lisfranc frank uh, injury. And this is something that you don't want to miss. So I like mentioning it to people just because you need to have a high index of suspicion. Otherwise, it can be missed and have problems in itself. So not, not to get too complicated, but I just wanted to put a couple uh, pictures up here just to give you a little bit of context of what we're going to be talking about. So just a little bit of anatomy. So what we're talking about, showing here on the left side, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. But here you have the fibula, which is your outside ankle bone. And there's three main ligaments that attach there, um, which are involved primarily in your ankle sprain. You have one called the anterior talofibular ligament, which is this ATFL. Again, I put it on a couple uh, diagrams here on the top, top right here. This is labeled by la label uh, A. 
Then down below that, you have called the calcaneal fibular ligament, which goes between the outside ankle bone and your calcaneus or your heel bone. And then more towards the back, uh, which is kind of covered by the tendons here on the left, but you can see it here on the right, called the posterior talofibular ligament. And these are the ligaments that are most uh, commonly injured when uh, you roll your ankle. And then behind that outside ankle bone, you have two tendons called your perineal tendons. And these very commonly can cause pain after an ankle uh, inversion type injury as well. Um, so as far as injuries uh, and the numbers, this is obviously a very common injury. You can walk across the street and throw a stone and probably hit 10 people who uh, who have rolled their ankles. So in one and every 10 ER visits, it's been reported that uh, this is uh, uh, the, the injury of uh, choice. Uh, so when you break it down, it happens 1.6 times every minute. Uh, it happens most commonly in our adolescent years, but obviously continues into our, uh, to our uh, older years. And the most common uh, time it happens is during some type of sporting event, whether it's basketball, football, soccer, but it can happen just easily uh, tripping off the curb. And when, when this happens, as you can see here on the top right, you get this kind of inversion injury where you're rolling that an ankle. And you can imagine you have those ligaments on the outside and that tends to tether them. And as they reach a critical point, they can either stretch, they can partially tear, they can completely rupture. Um, when they completely rupture, most commonly people tell me that they felt or heard even a pop, um, an audible pop. And it can be uh, quite uh, concerning, obviously, to the patient uh, if that were to happen. And they, these can look pretty ugly, as you can see on the bottom right. A lot of swelling, a lot of bruising here. Sometimes they could be mistaken uh, for a broken ankle or an ankle fracture. Um, so, you know, just very uh, important to have a high clinical suspicion and not just write it off that everything is just okay. When you talk about the clinical exam, what we talk about the ligaments in terms of stability, meaning that how much the ankles be able to held within the ankle joint. These ligaments are meant to hold the bones where they're meant to be. And obviously when they're torn or stretched, that can become problematic. Uh, very commonly, we'll get a, an x-ray just to rule out a break. Uh, there's certain things that I'll look on, on exam when, when you're here in the office, whether or not I need something in addition whether it's an MRI or a CAT scan. But a lot of times I can just tell on exam and with a simple x-ray uh, what's going on. Uh, these pictures on the bottom left, these are just two maneuvers, which I, I have a couple x-rays to show you. These are just two maneuvers to test the ligaments. This anterior drawer that's testing the, uh, the anterior talofibular ligament, which is the most common ligament to tear. Uh, they kind of work in a clockwise or a counterclockwise type fashion where you, you injure the ATFL and then the one that goes to the heel bone and subsequently the one in the back, which is rarely injured. This lateral Taylor tilt test uh, uh, test that calcaneal fibular ligament. And when we talk about uh, sprains in, uh, in the ankle or any joint, we, we tend to grade them, which helps us to determine care. So when we talk about ankle sprains specifically, which will come in handy later in the talk when we talk about um, the list frank or midfoot injuries, but grade one tends to be the most minor. So these are ones you roll your ankle, you tripped off the curb, you're able to walk it off. You have some pain, but there's really no instability. That ankle is uh, very tightly held within the ankle joint and there's not much limping. <clears throat> when you have a type two, uh, we refer to this as a partial tear. So the, the ligament for lack of a better term is stretched out. So you, you might have a little bit of instability or looseness to the ankle joint with those maneuvers that I had in the previous slide. And then with a complete tear, obviously there's nothing ter uh, tethering it and you can have significant instability with those maneuvers. Um, and as I was kind of mentioning, uh, or, or maybe I haven't, but, uh, you know, when this happens, it hurts in general, unless it's those grade ones and you can walk it off. So it's really hard to grade whether the joint is stable in that case. So, you know, I have something that I use in the office and I just kind of look at the patient clinically. So grade one, again, you're able to walk without a limp. There's minimal swelling, bruising, um, and you have some pain with reproduction of that mechanism of injury. When we talk about grade two, patients are usually coming in with a limp, you know, may need a crutch or two to kind of help get along. There's a lot more swelling, a lot more pinpoint tenderness, and you're, you're unable to do certain um, activities or tests such as going up on your toes or even hop on that ankle where you would be able to do on your grade ones. 
in grade three are those that, again, where this, the, the ligament is completely ruptured and, you know, these patients tend to not be able to put any weight on their ankle uh, whatsoever. So just something that, that I look for in the office to help me determine management. So the good thing is, is that the vast majority of these sprains uh, do well with non-surgical treatment and uh, always, especially in my hands, and I always put, om I put almost in here because I'll show you in, my, in, in a couple slides, but these never need to be fixed acutely. I get patients that come in into the office all the time who said that they had an MRI from somewhere else and say that their ligaments are torn and they need to be fixed. But as long as it's appropriately managed, this can heal on its own. And the way we do that is by using an ankle brace, which you can see here on the top uh, right, uh, labeled B here. Um, this is more so used for those grade ones or twos. Down here on the bottom right, if you're an athlete, we can get your ankle taped itself. And then the boot uh, is something that I reserve for more um, my grade twos and threes, just because those patients have a lot more pain and disability, and this will allow them to progress their weight bearing much sooner. And you wanna progress the patient's weight bearing and start range of motion to prevent stiffness as soon as possible. Um, and 85% of these go on to heal very well um, uh, over the course of about a two to three month period. Unfortunately, like many things in medicine, about 15% don't heal well and may need some more aggressive uh, treatment in terms of therapy. But as far as a mobile, uh, or I'm sorry, a, aggressive treatment in terms of surgery. Uh, in terms of immobilization, I tell people it can take anywhere from one to four weeks to really settle things down, but things again will continue to improve over the next several months. And then here, I just, this is why I put uh, uh, almost always non-surgical. So I don't know if you guys remember, this is a few years ago now when Pedro had, was running towards first base and had a significant inversion injury. And you can see that severe rolling of the ankle. So he actually had an ankle dislocation um, and this was actually an open injury, meaning it, it tore through the skin. But interestingly enough, he, the surgery was primarily to clean out the wound, close out the wound and his ankle was reduced and he was immobilized and actually the ligaments weren't reconstructed and he actually got back to a high level of play. Um, for a short, for a period of time. So I'm um, just going back to my notion that this in general is a non-surgical uh, injury initially. And again, about 15% go on to have problems and we talk about more chronic instability. And then, you know, the biggest thing I ask patients is, you know, some people do come in with pain, but I always ask patients, you know, do, do you trust the ankle? Could you step on a pebble and you feel like the ankle is going to roll? And that gives me a uh, as part of the history of that, that this is going on. So uh, you can see here, these are two x-rays that were taken. So this is the anterior drawer testing that ATFL ligament that I mentioned previously. And you can see, so this is called the talus bone. You can see how this is translated or kind of in front of this con, uh, concave uh, uh, portion of the distal tibia or your uh, the top portion of your ankle bone. This should not translate this much. Actually, it should be very minimal. So this tells me that that ligament is incompetent or very loose. Um, and this is called, again, the Taylor tilt test. I had the schematic up before, and you can see how there's significant gapping laterally or on the outside. So that tells me that that outside ligament, the uh, calcaneal fibular ligament is out as well. And again, the one in the back, the PTFL tends to be not really injured unless it's more severe, like in that ankle dislocation. Um, a lot of times in these cases, we'll get MRIs uh, to look for cartilage injuries. Uh, so our joints are aligned by a smooth uh, cartilage, uh, by smooth cartilage, which allows things to move up and down side to side. And you can imagine if things are unstable, there can be injury to the cartilage surface as well. Um, and, and again, it's been shown through research that up to 78% can develop arthritis if this chronic instability is, uh, is left untreated. You can try non-operative treatment, but that's more so, uh, again, uh, for more the, in the acute setting. I always feel, I always tell people, you know, if your ankle's unstable, 
uh, you know, wasn't treated initially appropriately, you kind of missed the boat, but you, you can always try. You can always use a brace if, if that's uh, what, the, uh, what you decide. Uh, but ultimately, uh, surgery can do very well. The technical term is called a brostrum procedure. So this just basically means that I'm tightening up those ligaments back down to the bone to stabilize the ankle. Back, uh, uh, back in the day, you used to have to mobilize people for an extended period of time to let those ligaments scar in and, and tighten up again and heal back down to the bone. Luckily, there's a number of uh, different devices these days that we've been able to use to basically augment or protect the repair and get people moving sooner, getting uh, weight bearing sooner. So it's, we've been able to get people back to sport and activities a lot sooner than in years past. And the outcomes are very good, about 90 per plus percent uh, good outcomes. So I just have here, I sorry, I forgot to mention in the beginning of the talk, I have a couple intraoperative pictures here in the past. I've been asked to show some, so uh, I can give people a heads up. You can close your eyes if you need to. Uh, but moving on our way to the uh, back portion of the ankle on the outside, again, I mentioned these perineal tendons. So these tendons run from the outside portion of your calf and they, uh, or they start as muscles on the outside portion of your calf. And as they go towards your ankle, they become tendons and they can be prone to tear from an acute injury. More commonly, I see them in a more chronic injuries um, in the scent or chronic uh, situations in the setting that actually we found that about 20% of people have tears in these tendons and are not symptomatic uh, at baseline. But if you have an inversion injury or an ankle sprain, it can kind of wake them up for a lack of a better term. Uh, the one tendon that's most commonly torn is the perineus brevis tendon. That's one I set, uh, showed here. This is the one that kind of hugs the back of the bone. And this tear is not necessarily like a tear where it's flopping in the breeze portion on top, portion of the bottom. It's kind of within the substance. Um, so uh, this can do well with uh, physical therapy, uh, brace wear, anti-inflammatories. Sometimes we do an ultrasound guided cortisone injection. You just got to be cautious in that regard, because obviously if the tendon is torn, it's weak and cortisone injections can further make it weak. So there, it's not a good idea in every situation, but it can be done in those, uh, those, uh, those that are. Uh, as far as surgery, uh, basically, we're doing a repair. So this is just a diagram that shows this split. Again, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but here's your outside ankle bone, the fibula bone, and you can see the split in the tendon, how it's perched over that outside area. And in surgery, you're basically cleaning up that area, cutting away the damaged portion, and then you repair it with a suture uh, or uh, you know, a small purse, a piece of uh, surgical rope, for lack of a better term. And this can have very good uh, outcomes as far as uh, postoperatively or non-weight bearing for about four weeks to let the, t the tear heal. And then we get you walking in a boot and subsequently physical therapy around somewhere around the four to six week time, depending on how bad the tear was. And then ultimately work your way to a brace and subsequently out. Most people are out of any form of boot or brace by about 10 to 12 weeks and getting back to function. But to get back to which, you know, the higher impact activities, it can take several more months. But in, if, as long as everything's healed, you're progressing along that timeline. Uh, there's one other condition with these tendons called the perineal tendon dislocation. Uh, so this is where the tendons are intact, but they're uh, unstable. So again, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but on the top right, there's a schematic here. So there's a very strong ligament, uh, for lack of a better term, that goes from the outside ankle bone to the heel bone, the calcaneus, called the superior perineal retinaculum. And that holds those tendons in position while they're functioning. And in certain types of injuries, this can be torn and kind of stripped off that fibula, which allows the tendons to perch over the outside ankle bone, the fibula. And you can see here on the bottom left uh, in this video, how it's actually physically popping over the outside ankle bone. This is a still picture on the bottom right where you can see that you shouldn't really see the outline of the tendon. It should sit within the recess or in the back of that uh, fibula bone. Uh, the most, uh, the best uh, study to get for this is called a dynamic ultrasound. So they actually do a musculoskeletal ultrasound where you're actively moving and dislocating the tendon to diagnose it, uh, a static or a staying still type of image, such as like an MRI is not the best to see this, but sometimes I'll get it to, if I have concerns about a possible tear that's not totally being picked up by the ultrasound. 
The problem with this one is there's not a lot of, you know, non-surgical treatment doesn't have great outcomes. Uh, as far as physical therapy, you can try a brace just to kind of immobilize that ankle to prevent the dislocation. But in general, if this becomes symptomatic or painful, this requires surgery. And the surgery basically involves repairing that, that ligament, the superior perineal retinaculum, but ultimately also at the same time, you're doing what's called a groove deepening procedure. Sorry, I have a spelling error here. Um, but basically what you do is deepen the back portion of the fibula bone to allow those tendons to really sit uh, in the back. And then you, you repair the ligament on the undersurface. So it really prevents the tendons from dislocating. This is a little bit longer in terms of uh, recovery in the sense that you got to wait for the bone to heal. So there is about a six week period of non-weight bearing. Uh, I do like to start early range of motion because these tendons tend to scar down. Um, and then when they say scar down, that can obviously be problematic uh, when they're not moving the way they're meant to be. Um, and then again, physical therapy, and then ultimately to a brace or, or directly to a shoe. As far as recovery, a lot of things in foot and ankle have similar recoveries in terms of timeline. It's just a matter of what we're using to get you there. So that's, uh, you know, the lateral ankle. So we'll continue to move, for, uh, move forward uh, or actually move backwards towards the heel. Again, this is something that I probably see the most commonly these days, especially uh, since pickleball. Uh, has really gained a lot of traction. Uh, when my wife asked me to play pickleball for the first time, I, I did play with some reservations, but uh, uh, just, uh, just know that this is something that I see commonly. So uh, when we talk about the Achilles tendon, there's different uh, parts of it. So up in your calf, uh, it starts in the calf muscles. So this is called the gastrocnemius soleus complex. So those are two big, those are the two big beefy muscles in the back of your calf. And then as things come down, it turns into a tendon and then inserts on the uh, back of your heel. And then as far as the Achilles tendon, uh, there's different parts of the Achilles tendon, which you can see here on the right side. So kind of higher up where there's this bigger, broader portion, this is called the myotendinous. Myo meaning uh, muscle, tendinous obviously meaning tendon. So that's where the muscle is transitioning and turning into tendon. Uh, so you can see that commonly. Most commonly we see ruptures in the mid substance, which is this, uh, you know, a little bit farther downstream. And then you have the insertional uh, and as the name ensues, it, uh, it's where it inserts on the back of the heel. Uh, most commonly, this happens uh, with trauma. And what happens is, is that, as you can see here with Howard on the top portion, you can see how his ankle is kind of bent up. That's called dorsiflexion or bringing your foot up. And what's happening when his foot is going up, his calf muscle is actually contracting that gastrocnemius soleus complex and is pulling on the tendon. So you have these two opposing forces. This is called an eccentric contracture. And that's what leads things to rupture if there's obviously some uh, wear and tear of that tendon. There's other things that can lead to it. Uh, commonly, you can see it in chronic steroids or certain um, antibiotics called the fluoroquinolones. The trade name is called Cipro or Leviquin. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. These, these antibiotics obviously have a place and, 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 and a need. Uh, so, but if you're on these medications, you just, if you have pain in the back of your heel, you may just not want to ignore it. Um, as far as, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna kind of start from the top to the bottom to keep things in line. So as far as myotendinous ruptures, which again can happen commonly, this is in general a non-surgical treatment unless there's a good amount of tendon above the level of the rupture. As you can imagine uh, that where this tears uh, is where there's a more muscle than tendon. So you can't really repair uh, uh, muscle to tendon because you can't really sew uh, the two ends together. So in general, this uh, is treated non-surgically and it has been published to have very good uh, results. Um, and I think I'll go into some tr uh, the non-surgical treatment when I talk about the, the mid-substance not to repeat things. So um, Moving on to the mid substance, which is the most common. Uh, this does happen in males more frequently than in females. Happens more in the uh, the mid forties, and it's more co most commonly sports related. But I've seen it in people who uh, again stepped off the curb the wrong way, tried to catch themselves. Um, you know, I've heard some crazy stories over the years. Um, 
But, uh, you know, as far as these injuries, uh, you need a high index of suspicion. So unfortunately, I see it more than I would like, but a lot of times it can be misdiagnosed initially. Uh, so a lot of times this is based on exam and, and, and you got to kind of, you know, obviously ask the pay, ask yourself where the pain's at, you know, think about the function if you're having issues going up on your toes and so forth. But it has been reported to be missed about 20 to 25% of the time if you're not thinking about it. And this very commonly is a clinical diagnosis, meaning that in general, and this was uh, published a few years back in the in the research uh, papers, uh, almost 100% of the time it can be diagnosed. The question sometimes where you may need an MRI is where does it where did it rupture? Because sometimes, as uh, I'll show in the next few pictures, it's hard to determine. And then just kind of airing off uh, at the, the mid-substance ruptures, the main reason why this is the most common uh, place for it to pop is, is the blood supply to the tendon. So again, here on the right, this is the picture that I had of previously. Here on the left shows the blood supply to the tendon. So you can see here, and again, this is a general picture. So there's an artery here with blood supply going to the tendon above blood supply going from the tendon below, and they kind of meet in the middle where you develop what's called a watershed zone, meaning that the blood supply is not the greatest. So it's very prone to wear and tear. So that's why uh, more commonly than not, that this is where the tendon tends to pop. And again, this is just a picture of uh, Rogers, which happened to him the other day. And again, I, I can in general diagnose, especially a traumatic injury, but in general, most things are not based on the history. So I'll ask them what they felt more commonly. You'll hear people feel, say that they got kicked or hit from behind, but they turned around and there was not, uh, no one there. I one time had a patient tell me that it felt like he got shot. I didn't ask him any more questions and just kind of went forward to treat him. Um, so again, here, these are the things that you look on exam. So here on the top left, you'll feel a formal palpable defect, meaning you'll feel tendon below, you'll feel tendon above, and then as you walk your fingers down, it'll kind of drop in. This is an intraoperative photo. Uh, hopefully it's clear on your end, but there's a complete rupture between, uh, between the top and the bottom portion of the tendon. The, this, uh, forceps here, the instrument here is holding the, uh, the distal portion toward the heel. And then there's something called resting tension. Uh, so when the tendon is tethered and intact, the foot will actually point somewhat up to the ceiling when the when you're laying down and bringing your feet up. That's uh, illustrated here on the left. And if the tendon's torn, as you can imagine, there's nothing tethering behind it. So that foot is going to be flatter. So that's something we call decreased resting tension. There's another uh, test called the Thompson test. When it's positive, we actually say that it's abnormal. So you can either do this in a sitting position. I tend to like to do it laying down just because the patient tends to be more comfortable. But this is where you basically squeeze the calf and if the tendon's intact, that your foot should basically push down because there's something connected. But if there's obviously nothing connected, when you squeeze that calf, the foot will not move. So when that's positive will say that that's abnormal, making us think that the tendon is ruptured. So when we talk about uh, non-surgical treatment, non-surgical treatment can do very well in the right setting. So we get a lot of our data, uh, our research uh, from Europe, because in general, they tend to be a lot more conservative with these. Uh, we have a lot more uh, research uh, because especially in the sports population, uh, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive. And there has been a number of studies that have come out, especially again in Europe, that when you look at non-surgical versus surgical treatment at about year, a year plus out from injury, the outcomes become somewhat equivalent. So meaning that they're about the same or similar. Um, where you see the differences is more earlier on, which is why you know this may, if you're looking to get back to a more active lifestyle, uh, you may want to consider fixing it. So when we treat these non-surgically, we're initially treating you in a boot. And again, I think it was, uh, you can see this boot here and I'm just showing you what's in there. So usually we put some wedges in there. A lot of times I'll put people on a splint initially for a couple of weeks, just allow the injury to settle down. People are obviously in pain and a splint or even a cast is, you know, it's hard to move things in there. So you're much more comfortable, but by two to three weeks, we're actually, I'm actually getting you walking in this boot with this wet, these wedges. And what that's allowing you to do is to keep 
uh, mobilizing, but also keeping those tendon edges close together to let the body heal. And the way the body heals, it doesn't really heal tendon to tendon. It heals very much like a ligament sprain. So again, like the ligament sprain, when it heals, it's scarring together. So uh, it just makes it, it connects the top and the bottom portion. So you're usually non-weight bearing, we'll just say two, three weeks max, get you walking in this boot with these wedges until roughly about five to six weeks. Uh, that is usually enough time uh, to allow the body to scar in. Again, that's based on my clinical exam in the office. And if everything is good, we'll start to wean these wedges. My protocol is to wean the wedges or take out one wedge, one every two weeks. Uh, usually the first six weeks or that five, six week period, I'm having you even sleep in the boot just to protect that that uh, position because you can imagine if you by chance get your foot caught in the sheets and you bring that foot up that can cause it to uh, tear again or, or cause it to heal longer. Um, and then during that time, you're doing physical therapy during your second six weeks, the goal is to get you out of the boot somewhere around the 10 to 12 week mark. Um, the upside of non-surgical treatment is that you avoid surgery. Uh, again, the downside, potentially, there's been a number of studies that show potential uh, increased risk of re-rupture, meaning that it can pop again. It's been reported about 10 to 15 percent uh, because there's nothing really tying those two ends together. And there's a little bit uh, of a longer time to get your strength back because you don't want to stress it that, you know, as much as if it was physically tied together. As far as operative or surgical intervention, it requires a direct uh end-to-end -end repair. There's many different ways to do this. There's minimally invasive, there's smaller mini incisions, bigger incisions. Uh, really, it just depends on the patient um, and, and the, the, the surgeon's uh, choice. Um, so as far as the surgical treatment, again, primary difference between this and non-operative treatment as far as the recovery is concerned is the actual physical tying of the two ends. Uh, the actual uh, post-op recovery is very similar to the non-surgical treatment in the sense that you're non-weight bearing for two weeks to let the, the incision heal. And then as long as the incisions heal, then we get you walking in a boot for a few weeks and then subsequently physical therapy. And again, if uh, you're looking to get back to more active lifestyle, uh, there's different things that we can do to, to strengthen that repair and hopefully get you back to sport a lot sooner. Um, this is just an intraoperative picture. This is uh, not a, this is a different type of uh, Achilles injury. It just was the best illustrated one, but you can see here the suture. This is green in this picture. The torn uh, portion is where the, the suture is coming out. Uh, the two sides, the knots are buried, but it's holding those two ends together. Uh, this is obviously a bigger incision. Again, like I said, this is a different uh, procedure. As far as my approach, uh, I, you know, this is an older picture. I've, I've gone on to a little bit more of a mini open approach, um, but, uh, you know, I still uh, tie those two ends together, make sure I get a great repair, because uh, again, uh, you know, you want to make sure you got good in what we call apposition or, or tethering of those tendon edges. There's different implants that we can do uh, to protect that repair, depending on what we're trying to, to get you back to doing. Um, as far as um, re-rupture rate, again, with surgical approach, it's much, it's a little bit less, about 10 to 15% less than the non-surgical. Obviously, there is an inherent uh, uh, small risk of a wound healing issue just because of surgery, uh, but as long as you do it in the right patient and perform uh, good soft tissue techniques intraoperatively, that's very uh, rare. So I think we're right on track. Uh, We'll just move on to more of the arch pain. All right. So when we talk about the arch, uh, sorry, I think I got my slides mixed up, but in the next picture, I'll be a little bit more uh, clear. Uh, but the biggest thing that we talk about in the arch, which is the middle portion of the foot, uh, is something called the Lis Frank injury. So this was a French guy way back when, French surgeon, uh, and he published it uh, based on uh, injuries that he was seeing in battle where the, the soldier's foot was being caught in the stirrups when he was having these injuries. And Luckily, uh, surgery and medicine has gone uh, as, as progressed because uh, back in the day, they actually treated this with amputation, which in general, we do not do that obviously now. So uh, as far as the, the, again, hopefully people can see my cursor, but here's an x-ray of a person's feet. 
the, uh, the, you can obviously make out the toes down towards the top of the picture where the circle here is on the right. That's where the list Frank, what we call interval is. But this is the general region as you work your way from the inside to the outside is the middle portion of the foot. And this is something that we refer to as what's called the rigid lever arm of the foot. So it, it connects the mobile uh, or, or movement of the ankle region and then the uh, movement of the, uh, the mobile segment of the, of the forefoot or the toes. Luckily, this is not a very common injury when you look at things on a global scale. I see it a lot more frequently because I'm an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon. Um, so it makes up about 0.2% of all foot injuries, tends to uh, happen in males uh, for various reasons. Maybe we get ourselves in uh, you know, predicaments that we shouldn't be in. Um, so this is just a schematic, again, looking at the bones. So this is the Lisfranc ligament. It connects to a bone called the medial cuneiform which is where on the top left, you can see uh, the arrow pointing to it. Sorry, this actually stopped short. It should be a little bit more to the left. And the blue uh, uh, rectangle is the trajectory uh, or the position of the ligament and connects to the base of the metato second metatarsal. Uh, on the bottom left, this is just a schematic showing it torn. And in, in, uh, in general, when this happens, that, that second metatarsal shifts out of position. And that second metatarsal, uh, in addition to the ligament, which gives it a lot of stability, much like the outside ligaments, uh, is 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 made. Uh, it looks like a keystone, so it does have some inherent stability, meaning that the bone itself gives it some stability. And this is just uh, a uh, schematic on the top here, kind of central to the right. Uh, showing those Roman arches. And uh, interestingly enough, that's also found in the foot. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a basis for the next few slides. Uh, as far as this mechanism, uh, this tends to happen when your foot is really pointed down. Uh, so you can see here on the top right, you can see how the toes are kind of positioned against the ground and you're, they're extended. And you can see how the foot is kind of in a more vertical position. And your ankle is what we call plantar flexed or point down. And then when the force goes up, it, it causes a lot of force to tear that ligament, which can also cause those bones to dislocate. And this comes into in various shades of gray. These can be uh, more on the minor end where it's just located at that second metatarsal base. They can be significantly much more severe where you completely dislocate um, the entire midfoot, but for the purposes of this talk, it's more so in the weekend warrior. So when we see them in more sports injuries, they tend to be uh, isolated to that second tarsum and tarsal region or the second metatarsal base. And again, this is another injury that you have to have a high index of suspicion because a lot of times this can be missed. So things that you look for, if you're having pain in the middle portion of your foot, obviously if it's minor, you're able to walk it off, it's likely not this injury. But if you're having trouble walking, get a lot of swelling, you wanna check and make sure that you ha don't have bruising on the bottom of the foot, as you can see here in this central, central picture. Uh, a lot of times that can give you a high index of suspicion, especially if the x-rays are normal. And that'll come into play in the next couple of slides. Uh, a lot of times uh, you can provoke pain by doing this, what we call a uh, stress maneuver where uh, you're stressing those ligaments. Uh, and as you can imagine, you know, especially when this first happens, uh, people don't tolerate this very well. And like the, uh, the other injury, uh, the Achilles, this can be frequently missed and has been reported up to about 20% of the time. So the biggest thing when, when patients come into my office and I, and they have midfoot pain, you know, they'll come in with uh, non weight bearing x-rays, meaning you went to the urgent care, you went to the uh, emergency room and they got x-rays with you laying down. Uh, if this is a more subtle injury where it's not terribly obvious, uh, this is when it can be missed because the foot, much like many joints in our body is a dynamic structure. So when you add stress, it can change. So this is why uh, I'll routinely ask patients to put weight on it. You know, I won't ask them to hop on one foot or stand on one foot or put as much weight on it as they can comfortably do. Uh, but a lot of times you can diagnose this injury with this simple study and x-ray in the office. Um, 
So uh, that's uh, that uh, is something that I routinely ask. And these are just x-rays that I look for. Uh, this is what I look for in the x-ray. So just to give you a little bit of a background. So you can see here, this is a normal foot, this red line, you can see how, so this is called the middle cuneiform. This line basically lines up with the joint in the middle here and goes along the uh, inside portion of the bone. You can see here where the ligament is torn. You can see this red line where it's on the uh, out, uh, this portion of the, uh, middle cuneiform, but you can see how the second metatarsal is shifted over. The only way that this happens is if that ligament is torn. So you can, you can see the difference in the distances. And obviously here you can see uh, the gap and something that I look for is something called the flex sign. These are just little fragments of bone. Again, I'm not sure you can see my uh, cursor, but this is basically where the, the ligament has evolved or pulled off the bone and therefore is incompetent. So a lot of times I though will ultimately get an MRI or a CAT scan. I'll get an MRI primarily uh, in the setting if uh, I'm unsure if the ligament is torn. So for instance, if the patient can't put a lot of weight on it, um, this way, you know, I can actually physically see the ligament. And then if I have concerns for additional breaks in the bones, I'll get a CAT scan. So a CAT scan is very good at looking at bone. An MRI is very good looking at soft tissue, tendons, ligaments, cartilage, and so forth. And then ultimately, this comes into uh, most into play when the, the ligament, again, looks partially torn. And I'm unsure if it's incompetent or if it's not doing its job. I'll do that stress test. But a lot of times I'll bring the patient to the operating room and do it under anesthesia so it's better tolerated. Uh, obviously, when you're able to tolerate it better, you're comfortable, you're sleeping, uh, I can get a better view of, of that uh, stability. So again, this is just a schematic. Everything we look at in terms of orthopedics is usually in terms of stages or grades. Grade one is the one that is the only time you can consider treating this non-surgically. So this means that the ligament is basically intact, but just may have had some type of stretching episode. And, the, and this means here in the uh, red portion, less than two millimeters, meaning that that gap between uh, the distance of the bones that I had up there before in the x-ray is less than two millimeters. That tells me that everything is stable. Stage two obviously gets wider and wider as you move up on the stage uh, three. So as far as treatment, uh, the uh, non-surgical treatment, this is not a stage uh, one or grade one on the top right. This is more of a, a grade three, I would say. Uh, but if you have a grade one injury, you can treat this non-surgically, but you have to remain non-weight bearing for about uh, four to six weeks to allow that ligament again to scar into position. So once uh, that time comes, four to six weeks, we examine you, get a new x-ray. If everything seems to be progressing, they get you walking in a boot uh, for another six weeks. And we can get you into some physical therapy at that point, usually with an arch support or an orthotic. Uh, just because this is the region where that ligament lives and it just helps support it. And as far as grade two and three, this is always a surgical treatment because it does not heal well on its own. And what happens is, is when the ligament is torn and it's not treated appropriately, you can develop what's called post-traumatic arthritis or arthritis uh, from an injury. And also this ligament is very important in maintaining your arch. So if obviously it's torn, it's not able to do that. So you can get progressive arch collapse. And then the surgery becomes a lot more fun for me, but not for you. Um, there's different ways of treating these. It's kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but I just put it up here for informational purposes. There's something called an OR. O-R-I-F, which means open reduction, internal fixation, which just means that you're putting plates plus or, or screws plus or minus plates in there. And that just is meant to hold the bones in position where they're supposed to be. And the body again heals together at that ligament region, much like an ankle sprain. There's something called a, a fusion procedure or the technical term is called arthrodesis. And this is a procedure where you're actually taking away the joints that are involved in getting the bones to knit together. And when they heal together, the joint disappears. So once the joint disappears and they're healed together, you don't have to rely on the, the ligament, the scar tissue to hold things in position. And people, get, you know, there's different joints that we can fuse. And whenever people hear the word fusion, they can get a little nervous. Uh, the good thing is, is that when these bones fuse together, they're obviously less mobile. But the good thing about this area of the foot, it's, it's a rigid portion of the foot. It's not meant to move much anyway. When it does move uh, more, for instance, in other conditions, it can actually cause other problems in itself. 
but as regards to which route to go, ORAF versus primary versus arthrodesis or fusion, it is somewhat controversial. Uh, if it's more of a sports injury uh, or it's fairly localized to the, the list frank interval, which is just here on the left side, you can see how this bone is shifted over. There's a little piece of bone there where the ligament was attached. I tend to still do, as long as I can just fix it with one or two screws most, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do that uh, just because I do want to obviously maintain motion when I can. Uh, and a lot of times you can do this with a single screw. And again, it's going from this med medial cuneiform, you reduce or put the bone where it's meant to be and the screw holds it in position. And then again, the body heals together. This picture on the bottom right, this is more of a more extensive list frank injury. Uh, this patient actually had uh, some arthritis that was setting in. So this is where you're putting in much more hardware, getting things to heal together. And actually this person's joints were gone, but they actually got to back to running around a track uh, for uh, miles at a time, uh, about a year out from surgery. So there are some, there's a lot of studies out there that show, especially for the higher energy injuries, the more involved injuries that a fusion does better for lower energy athletic type injuries, like here on the bottom left and ORAF can do very well. In general, you're non-weight bearing for about six weeks. Uh, and then again, progress your weight bearing in a boot, physical therapy, arch support, usually return to sport for this type of injury is somewhere around four to six months, depending on the sport, higher impact, obviously you're leaning more towards six. So I think we're running right on time. So just coming up on uh, our conclusions. So there are many causes of foot and ankle pain in the everyday athlete. Uh, there is appropriate treatment, and, and again, both non-surgically and surgically, but to come to the right treatment, you need to perform a good history, physical exam, and imaging when necessary, uh, and most conditions do have excellent outcomes with return to sport with both non-operative and uh, operative intervention when necessary. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Winters. Um, again, I always learn something new every time. So some of the questions that came in um, is what is the complications of any, I guess, foot or ankle surgery? Yeah. So what I tell people, I mean, again, it varies depending on the procedure in general, it's the similar, um, it's similar with uh, any surgery, you know, infection, wound healing issues, bone healing issues. If you're doing a fusion, for instance, um, you know, depending on the, the surgical technique, the, the procedure itself, you know, there are, um, you know, some may have higher risk factors in terms of wound complications. Um, but as long as you have good surgical technique and address things, it's, it's relatively low. Wonderful. Thank you. What is your suggested um, therapy for a total foot and ankle? So I'm going to just I'm gonna assume that it means like a total ankle replacement. Um, yes, I'm guessing uh, that's right. So, um, as far, again, we didn't touch on this here and, you know, that, that can get you back to a more active lifestyle. It's usually, you know, more low impact lifestyle. It's very similar in terms of the other injuries and, and procedures in the sense that I usually, the, the way that I go about it is I keep you non-weight bearing for roughly four to six weeks. That allows the implant to actually grow into the bone. Uh, so you're getting around with a knee scooter. There's different ways of getting around. Uh, they see people with these eye walks now. So you're functional, uh, but you're not able to put weight on it during, while things are healing. And then once things are healed, you start walking a boot, physical therapy. Most times after a total ankle, people are out of a boot somewhere around eight, somewhere between eight and 12 weeks, depending on the procedure. When, when you do a total ankle, there may be other procedures that you do simultaneously that may prolong it. Is there any preventative measures if you have like foot and ankle, like twinges here and there? Is there something that a, someone can do to prevent that if they know they're having some issues at this time? With yeah. That? yeah, I mean, what I tell people, especially if you're prone to roll on your ankle or, or uh, you know, you just have, you know, when you're more active, you're getting these twinges, you know, getting an ankle brace or even these sleeves can help. Sometimes just the compression alone gives people relief. I usually recommend more of a, figure of eight lace up ankle brace. It just, it's more of a sports brace, gives you a little bit more stability. Um, that's the best thing as far as the ankles concerned, and that can help with Achilles stuff as well. Um, 
even if you have a little bit of arthritis. Uh, as far as the foot, it's mostly an orthotic or shoe insert. And they do make these sports orthotics that make them a little bit more comfortable to wear in your in your sneakers. Okay, one question just came in. Do you ever use reinforcement of Achilles repairs with tape synthetic material? Yeah, so that's kind of a very controversial uh, topic. Again, we can talk about that in and out for an hour itself. Okay. In certain situations, I do, uh, and it really just depends on the the tendon substance. So if someone's, you know, sometimes when you go into surgery, these tendons can look for lack of a better term, like a mop head, right? So there's, they lost their integrity and you need to reinforce them. So uh, not always, but in the right situation I do. And I think they do have their place. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure how this is going to be too involved of a question, but it says, please discuss the fifth metatarsal fracture. Okay. Yeah. No and that's another one that I thought about uh, throwing in there, but as you can tell, we're, we, you know, it already, you know, my talk, uh, close to that hour mark, right. but, uh, that's a common injury as well. And most commonly that happens with the, again, like an ankle sprain or an inversion type injury. And what happens actually in the, the, the slide that I had those perineal tendons. So the perineus brevis actually attaches to the base of the fifth metatarsal. So you can imagine when you roll your ankle, it tethers that bone and it can cause it to break. As far as treatment, it it really comes down to where the break is. So uh, in certain, if it breaks in a certain uh, position that routinely is non-surgical uh, and you can weight bear in a boot while it's healing, as long as the bones are relatively close together, uh, there's a break called the Jones fracture, which most people have heard about who have injuries to this, uh, you know, they've been on uh, Google and whatnot. Um, as far as how to treat that, it really just comes down to the patient, um, you know, patient age, function, and so forth. Because uh, again, these happen during injuries. They can happen with tripping off the curb if you're 80 years old. Um, all I'll say is, is that those, the Jones fracture tends to heal better with surgery. It's a minimally invasive surgery. Just basically put a screw across it as long as it's a clean break. Sometimes if it's a comminuted or many uh, pieces type of break, sometimes you need to do a plate, but the screw does increase the chances of it healing significantly in a more predictable time frame. Um, but if you were to treat it non-surgically, then, a, you know, you just have to keep your weight off of it to avoid it from going on to what we call a non-union or it doesn't heal. So hopefully okay, that, that was kind of a loaded question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did well, think about putting that in there maybe for the next time. Well, next time. Again, yeah. if anyone has any further questions, you have, you can email myself or Dr. Winters. And that is also in the chat box. One question came in, what are your thoughts on shockwave therapy for heel spurs and with plantar fasciitis? Yeah. So uh, as far as shockwave therapy, uh, there are studies that show that it can work. The unfortunate thing is, is that not a lot of insurance plans cover it. You know, I don't want to say it's experimental because again, there's a lot of research that show that it can work. It's just that the outcomes are not we'll say they're equivocal in the set in the sense that meaning that there's some studies that show that it works or some studies that show that it doesn't. So uh, it doesn't burn a bridge because it's all external. So if it does, if, if you're having issues with your plantar fascia and the other modalities aren't working, uh, either if you have the financial ability to pay for it or your insurance pays for it, uh, you know, I think it's worthwhile. I do offer it to people. We don't I don't personally do it, and I don't think anybody here at the Rothman Institute does it. But there's people in the region that do, um, that can help. That we can help guide you to, to to give it a try. Okay. Can plantar fasciitis be mistaken for any of these surgical um, things that you talked about today? Uh, not today. There okay. is a condition called tarsal tunnel syndrome, which is basically similar to carpal tunnel syndrome. So there's a nerve that uh, wraps around the inner aspect of the ankle. And sometimes that nerve can become compressed for various reasons. Uh, and when a nerve becomes compressed, it can cause radiating pain. One of the branches of that nerve goes to the bottom inside portion of the heel. Um, so, so sometimes they happen at, you know, simultaneously, but that's the most common reason. There's obviously tendons and so forth that can uh, be in the region that can be a culprit as well. But the most common thing uh, could be that compression of the nerve. 
Okay. Is there any, oh, how many cortisone shots can you get for arthritic pain in the top of your foot? So, so as far as injections, my kind of rule of thumb is I like to not do them more frequently than every three months. There's been studies that show that if you give cortisone or a steroid into a joint more frequently, it can cause actually the cause a problem, cause the, the, the cartilage that I spoke of earlier to, to break down more or more quickly. Uh, so usually every three months, as far as the, you know, the foot and the ankle, it's different than other bigger joints in our body, such as the knee, uh, and so forth, uh, the shoulder, uh, the ankle, the big toe joint, there's another joint below your ankle that we can do injections in the office personally, for other joints in particular, uh, I think you said the top of the foot, I'm assuming that's more in the middle. Those are those midfoot joints that I was referring to, the Lis Frank joints, they're very tiny. So uh, I'd like to send those to, for instance, down here, uh, an imaging facility like Atlantic Medical Imaging Shore and so forth, uh, where the radiologist can physically see the needle going into the joint. Because if I try in the office without any imaging guidance, I have no idea if I'm in the right spot. And then if I'm not in the right spot and you come back and tell me that you didn't get any relief, I don't know, you know, I, you know, you're not, you know, it's not going to be of any benefit to you. So no frequently than every three months. Okay. And if Thank you come you. back and tell me that you've had only relief for a few weeks to a month, it's probably not worthwhile doing additional. Okay. This is going to be the last question for the evening. Would you suggest a visit with an orthopedic surgeon for continuous heel pain? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, there's again, uh, again, I spoke to about the Achilles uh, tear. There's also chronic conditions called Achilles tendonitis that can be treated. Uh, you know, someone, you know, we were talking briefly about plantar fasciitis, which is very common. There's many different things that can be causing your pain and there's usually something that can be done. Well, thank you, Dr. Winters. Thank you, everyone, for um, joining us this evening. We thank you for your time, Dr. Winters, for sharing all this valuable information. Again, if you need to reach out to us, you can always call us on the Rothman main number. It's 1-800-321-9999, or you can always look at, at Rothman Ortho on the website as well. And I also included my email. If you have any questions, I can always forward that over to Dr. Winters. So again, thank you, Dr. Winters, for your time and everybody for joining us this evening, and we appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good, good one. Night, guys.